57talk.com. Gary Cubetta back. Uh, we are in March. It's still March, right, Larry? By one day. Okay. Better do it quick. We'll be April Fool's Day, and then nobody will believe what we say. Uh, 2010. We do these late at night, so we do the best <laughs> we can. Larry, great to, Larry Madison, great to have you back with us. And great to be back, Gary. Uh, looking forward to, as we talk about 1982, you know, a lot of people, when they get into wrestling gossip, they like to hear war stories of fights between wrestlers and guys getting drunk and chasing women. This isn't going to be about that, but this will be about, really, how wrestling really works, what happens behind the closed doors, and not just in St. Louis, because you can apply some of what happened here to many different territories and many different towns around the country over a 40, 50-year period. Uh, this is not uncommon to wrestling or, to a certain extent, to businesses of any kind. But uh, it's certainly a very human story, and, uh, I, I, of course, I was involved in it, so I think it's kind of an interesting story. I just hope somebody else does. Well, I think it's interesting, and I know it's something that you'll never forget because it was such an important time in your life. And it well, we'll 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 tell how it all turns out as uh, as the show progresses. January first, nineteen eighty two, the Checker Dome sell out nineteen thousand eight one nine. All time attendance and gate receipt record. Sam Muchnick's farewell as promoter. Uh, when we say a sellout of nineteen thousand eight nineteen, we weren't kidding. Even the uh, business boxes, the executive boxes were sold out. They turned them over to us, and whatever, there were a lot of businesses actually that kept their boxes for that night because they all knew Sam and they knew about wrestling in St. Louis. But those that were turned out for sale were sold out. But we, we were sold out roughly five days in advance. In my mind, we probably could have taken this to Bush. If it had been summer, I think we could have taken it to Bush Stadium and drawn 30000 But uh, be that as it may, hey, it was a sellout. What an incredible feeling to see a crowd like that in a building as big as the Checker Dome. It, it was mind-boggling. And, of course, as we've talked about, a night to remember, a night that would be a turning point when you look back in the history of wrestling, not only in St. Louis, but perhaps everywhere. Well, the feeling was different that night. Uh, how much different? Well, it was different because, I mean, without question, the, the, the primary purpose, the, the reason we were there was to honor Sam. And it wasn't just that, uh, I mean, we we did a quite a, a fancy introduction of Sam. We actually played music, played the uh, triumphant theme from Star Wars when Sam walked down the aisle. We had spotlights on him. Uh, Sam was almost embarrassed by it. He had no idea what we were going to do or what I was going to do uh, with Charlie Mancuso, the manager of the Checker Dome, and his staff. We would put together quite an evening, and the only thing I had told Sam was, "We're going to introduce a few people in the ring with you before we let you talk. Is that okay?" Well, sure. And uh, for anybody who's into collecting videos, again, go to Classic St. Louis Wrestling Volume 10. That is the Sam Muchnick farewell card. Probably a little bit less wrestling and a lot more of people being introduced in the ring and then in particular the private party afterwards, which is uh, the only people who had copies of that tape were Sam and myself and, and Sam's kids. And this is in Volume 10. I put that on there because there were so many touching moments uh, involving people like Gene Kaniski and Joe Garagiola and, and just the cops that worked for Sam over the years there. Just different things that uh, I thought put all together, hopefully it would tell a story of why wrestling and Sam Mushnick were just so unique in the town. It, 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 it was a special night. We knew it going in. Uh, the wrestling was good. It was solid. And probably nobody cared, if you know what I mean. They did care. But there was something else going on, and I think as an, as an audience, those 19,819 people, they respected that and they understood it. Did, were, were the video cameras rolling that night? Did you have like a full film crew? No, the only thing we did uh, was Channel 11 took one camera, believe it or not, went to the press box and taped this thing, and then they took the camera down in the ring and they, and they taped both uh, the ceremony we had for Sam in the ring and then later at the party afterwards. In the ring... We probably bought, I guess I should have looked up all the names, we probably brought about 25 people through that ring, including the sports editors of both the Globe and Globe Democrat and St. Louis Post-Dispatch, including the sports anchors from the network affiliates who were there to honor Sam. People, and he didn't know they were going to be there, personal friends of his in a couple of cases. Uh, Wally Carbo was there. Frank Tunney was there. Uh, Vern Gagne, of course, was there. And we walked, we introduced all those people and put them through. And then at the very end, 
Sam, we caught him totally by surprise, and, and Sam, Joe Garagiola's brother, Mickey, helped sneak him in along with Charlie Mancuso. So we brought Joe Garagiola to the ring. And if you see that classic uh, St. Louis Wrestling Volume 10, you'll see uh, the cameras on him when we bring, Sam, bring Joe Garagiola to the ring, unknown to Sam. Sam looks like he just took a body punch. He kind of takes a step back, and he smiles so big. Oh, my God, it's Joe, and they hug each other in the middle of the ring. And it was just very neat, not at all choreographed set the feelings that that came out there the people reacting for sam so we did that in the ring for the people and it, it took us 15 20 minutes and i don't think anybody cared which was uh i guess a tribute to sam now that night wrestling nwa champion rick flair versus dusty Rhodes, gene kaniski special referee and flair wins two out of three falls clean finish right in the middle of the ring uh and in the co-feature semifinal, I guess you would call it, Dick the Bruiser did live up to the promise he'd made at the end of 1981 that he would not get disqualified, that he would not get counted out of the ring, and he pinned Ken Patera to win the Missouri State title. Uh, tag team match with David Von Erich and Rufus R. Jones at a double disqualification against Harley Race and Greg Valentine. Strong undercard, Pat O'Connor's what was supposed to be his farewell match. Uh, he put Bob Sweetan to sleep in about four minutes, and uh, that was his farewell match and of course it had been announced that the new regime of the St. Louis Wrestling Club would be me as the general manager and O'Connor as the matchmaker uh, as far as the public was concerned so that was an interesting evening too that was an interesting point there too and of course O'Connor and I did the handshake and everything in the ring and that was kind of I guess introducing the so-called new guard at the time. Now after the show Larry Matisic named general manager of the St. Louis Wrestling Club Bob Geigel announced as president is this what's after the show mean when the show's completed? Well, technically, yes, and uh, yeah, and and Sam, we we talked about it again in that private party. Just uh, Sam, brought, we brought Bob Geigel to the microphone, let Bob talk because we had in the private party we had all those people who'd been in the ring, plus probably another three hundred people who just who were business people uh, across the board, people that had done business with us, policemen, firemen, uh, politicians. Uh, the mayor was there. Just all these different people were all there. So Bob was introduced. Uh, Sam talked to Pat O'Connor. Uh, at the very end, I brought Gene Kaniski to the, to the microphone. I should say, let me rephrase that. I brought Joe Gargiola to the microphone. He brought Gene Kaniski to the microphone then with him. And those two just totally off the cuff did this uh, comedy routine for like five minutes. It was hilarious. Had everybody broke up, and then all of a sudden Gene got very serious, very serious. He talked about... His one regret was that Helen Muchnick wasn't there to see this. And uh, he, he kind of broke Sam up and gave him a hug at the end of the thing. And, and it was a really, it was a neat, just a neat emotional moment to see people like Kaniski acting that way. On a personal note, all the wrestlers were there too, and coats and ties and looking sharp. And uh, my wife was there and on the verge of giving birth to our daughter. David Von Erich, who was a good friend, spent the entire party looking out for my wife, Pat, do you need to sit down? Are you okay? Do you think you need to go to the hospital? Should I get Larry? Is everything okay? What can I do? Would you like water? Would you like a soda? Do you need a chair? Is that chair okay? It, it, you know, every time I look over, there was poor David running around like you know he was his, he was my wife's uh, servant. What can I do? What can I do? We still laugh about that to this day. And in fact, all the wrestlers were very respectful, as as most wrestlers are about family. I think every single one of them, at one point or another, came over there. And, you okay? You okay, Pat? Is there anything we can do? It, it was kind of a funny behind-the-scenes little note that I still have to laugh about today. Larry, did you see any backstage politics? I know it's going to develop, but that night, was that... Uh, was That that night, no. Yeah. That night, no. And again, and, and I talk about this in the wrestling at the Chase book, it's my final chapter. And when I wrote the book, I knew it was going to be my final chapter, was that show. And the very end of the night, I mean, for me, it was an incredibly, it was a heck of a lot of work to put it all together. And uh, couldn't have done it without the folks at the Checker Dome, because basically I was using them as a second office. I tell Sam in the middle of the afternoon, hey, I got to go, I got things to do, leave Sam at the wrestling office, and I go over to the Checker Dome calling people, making sure how we're going to get this person there, get that person there, what we're going to do with the spotlights and all, various things like that. At the end of the night, after the the old building, the old barn's dark and empty, Probably the last people leaving, along with the checkered home people, were myself, my wife, Gene Kaniski, and Vern Gagne. So we give Kaniski and Gagne a ride back to the Chase Hotel, which was only oh, four miles, five miles probably from the checkered home. And, of course, they were also 
very respectful of Pat because you know she's nine months pregnant. You know, so she's huge. So they crawl in the back seat. Pat's in the front seat, and I hear them whispering to each other as we pull out of the checker to them. And all of a sudden, Kaniski and Ganya start singing, there's no business like show business, there's no business. I mean, and they serenaded us all the way to the Chase Hotel. It was. It I was, can picture that. It, it was a touching moment. I mean, it, it was really neat. You know, and, and I've mentioned that to Kaniski because we've talked a few times before his health has really taken turns for the worse here over the last couple of months. And Jesus, oh, I remember that. He says, I sang all the time. He says, I sang to Helen Muchnick. I sang to, I sang to Frank Tunney's wife. I sang to all the wives. It, it was hilarious. It, it was a great evening. He was not a very good singer. but he, No, he I, I, up, I, would, I would imagine that he wouldn't be. He made up for his lack of uh, tunefulness with enthusiasm. Wow. And so did Ganya. So, so Larry, th- this is a, was this a Friday night? This was, I got to look back, was that a Saturday night? Was that, uh, I think it was a Friday night show. Yeah, it was a Friday night show, that's correct. Okay, so we have the Friday night show. What's different when you go into the office Monday morning? Oh, Monday morning. Well, it actually was Tuesday till I realized what was different. Monday, I was still overloaded, you know, getting the next show dad together, getting the program out. Monday wasn't a whole lot different, although Sam wasn't there. I guess that was different, and basically, I was in the office by myself. After all those years, it had been me and Sam, me and Sam and Wild Bill Longson. Uh, now it's just me. And, but I still had so much to do that Monday with the proofs for the wrestling news and, and just, just various things, finishing up advertising the next show. Tuesday's where I saw the difference because I sat down and got the checkbook out. I can sign the checks now and early. I'm the general manager. We had a stack of a few, not a huge number of bills. We had a bunch of bills. And I opened up the checkbook, just as Sam would do, because you got to catch up. you got to got to pay the bills right away. More important now than ever, because Sam's not there. Larry's the general manager. And I opened up the checkbook, and I looked at the total that we had in the checking, and it was like $200. I couldn't pay any bills. Oh, what, boy. What Geigel had done, Bob Geigel and the partners, and this is not, I mean, this is just the way they did their business. I knew for years the St. Louis Wrestling Club had, under Sam, had always divided profit every quarter. Four times a year they would get a check. The partners would get a check from Sam. Everything went through an accountant by the name of Richard Kawanishi out in Clayton, Missouri. Uh, everything would come every quarter. Sam had a base amount of money that he would never let the checking dip below. And in my mind, I could be off on this by 1000 his zero was $5,000. In other words, if he got down to $6,000, he really, in his mind, was down to $1,000. There would always be $5,000 in checking because from his, his perspective, you never know what's going to happen. And he was a big fan of paying, and I think we've talked about this, for instance, the guarantee the Keel Auditorium out of the checker dome a couple shows in advance. And after card, and you have bills, whether it's printing bills, rent at the Chase Hotel, I mean, there's, there's just bills. Well, here I'm sitting with $250. The first day I'm supposed to be paying checks. So first thing I do is just call Geigel. What happened? He says, well, he says, you know, it's new ownership now. And he says, and I got a check here for you because you're going to percentage of profit too. You know, he says, we're going to take, we're going to take profits off every, after every show. And I said, well, Bob, how can we do that? I got to have money to pay the bills. He says, well, don't worry about it. Just, just, you know, wait till the next, the money starts coming in on the advanced sale for the next show in two or three weeks, and then you pay your bill. Says, we can't do that, Bob. This is St. Louis. They've had 40 years of Sam much. They paying the bill the day before it comes. We can't do that. So I ended up, Geigel and I had a fight, and I told him I'm going home. It's useless. I quit. And I went home. You quit the, You quit on Tuesday? I, I quit that Tuesday, <laughs> and I called Sam. And Sam had a heart attack. He went nuts. Uh, Now, I'm home, and, of course, my wife is in the process of getting ready to give birth. In fact, that Thursday, January 7th, my daughter Kelly Matisik was born. Hello, happy birthday, Kelly. Uh, We just point that out. But anyhow, so what basically happened was Geigel called me back then that night at home. He says, well, yeah, we've got to rethink that. He says, I've got to check on the way to you. I'll send it overnight so you'll have enough in there to work with. Okay. Well, I think it was like $2,000, and it it did give me enough to cover this stuff. But that was an ongoing argument, the distribution and of how to how to handle profit, most territories did it the way Geigel did it. I think in the most cases before after big shows, whoever was involved in the partnerships in most territories were owned by more than just one person. 
they would divide up the money and take it. That's the way they did it. Sam ran it like a business. It was going to be every quarter. And when you got your profit check, you also had a statement from the CPA about all the expenses that were paid. It was done like a business, a very serious business. This is funny. So, <laughs> Well, it was, except for the fact that I'm sitting there, and now my name's on it. Hey, Larry's the general manager. You know, yeah, Mattisick got in there, Muchnick's gone, and now the SOB doesn't pay the bills for three weeks. So so what you go home and tell your wife? Uh, th- uh, oh, I, oh, she knew these th- we knew there were going to be problems. This is going to get ugly. Yeah, I, I knew this was this was going to be an ongoing problem. And when we battled about it, I mean, we we kind of had a truce, but it was an ongoing tension about how to divide how to divide profits. And of course, the argument they made, not without a certain amount of understanding, what they're saying to me, and they can't understand. It just shows the difference in philosophy. And we're going to talk a lot about this as we go into '82. But just the difference in how we're brought up in the business. Well, Larry, you're taking money out of it too. Don't you want your money right away? Well, yeah, it was fine, but of course I'm getting a salary anyway. Was I didn't need it to live? No. So if I got it in March or if I got it in January, I mean, as long as I got it, that's all I was concerned were they, about. Was it? You don't have to give the number. Were they ge- were they generous with it? Yeah, it was fine. Of course, it, when, when I got hired back that at, later that evening, uh, we added I think you know, a couple hundred dollars to the weekly to the monthly salary or whatever it was. So you know, I made a little more money by quitting. <laughs> Which was, I mean, you know, what a first week. I mean, we, Sam retires, I quit, I'm rehired, my wife has a baby all in one week. Jeez. So how much How much would have been in the business checking account before, right after that show? I mean, oh, after that 20,000 people. Oh, there could, have, there could have been, oh, there easily could have been eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000. And they just split that money right up? Split the money right up and uh, took the checks and off we went. Except then they had to send a little bit back to get, get us back to thing. Where normally... Sam would have held that money. He probably, knowing how he operated too quite often, he talked to the CPA, okay, we're going to need this back. We're going to split profits later. But you never know. You may have a show that loses money. You never know what will happen. And something's going to happen here and very quickly in 1982 that will scare him. Okay, okay. But nonetheless, Sam would then maybe say, okay, well, I can afford to take $30,000 out of this. I'll buy a CD for – I'll buy some sort of investment vehicle for two months, for three months, thus earning interest. You know, and, and there's, there were different ways with, that actually would help them make a little bit more money. Not a lot. Of course not. You're splitting it four or five ways. But nonetheless, it was more money as opposed to splitting it all up at once, which was the normal way to do business in wrestling. But St. Louis just didn't do it that way. So, yeah, it was quite a first week in 1982. Okay, January 3rd, 82 TV taping, handicap tag bout. Uh, Crusher Blackwell against Tom Malley and Dewey Robertson. Rule no contest. Robertson and Blackwell were both counted out outside the ring. We were trying to give Dewey a little push. I was interested in giving Dewey Robertson a push as well. He kind of had a look, and, and we've talked about the, the problems he had on interviews and everything, that he really never could get over the hump to the true main eventer. But since he was being booked by Kansas City, it kind of made everybody happy. kind of took a little of the aggravation off there where, why, you, why do you want to push this guy from Florida? Why do you want to push this guy from Ghana? Let's push somebody from Kansas City. Well, it's pushing somebody from Kansas City, which in this case was Dewey Robertson. Was he, did he, was he doing steroids at that point? Uh, he was, had a good build. If he was, I mean, I was pretty naive about steroids at that point. I'm sure a few guys were, yeah. but none of them certainly to the levels that we've seen in the, in the periods that passed. Nobody was that huge. I mean, Dewey just looked like a well-muscled athlete who mm-hmm. lifted weights. Okay, January twenty second, nineteen eighty two, Keel Auditorium. This is the first house show without Sam. Yeah, uh, funny how, feeling. To give me an idea, Larry, was the was the setup for this different, or was it pretty much business as usual? Well, business as usual, and, and as it should be. I mean, you're buying a promotion, and anybody who's been listening to these us talking about uh, these results and, and the attendance figures, the attendance figures were never bad, even in the slow mid seventies. But certainly in 79, 80, 81, the attendance was through the roof. Why would you want to mess with it? And uh, here we were, the second show in January, 8,450. So uh, that's a pretty impressive thing right there. Ironically, we lost two wrestlers off that show because there was a blizzard in Minneapolis where Ken Patera and Crusher Blackwell couldn't get in. So the one main event had to be changed uh, where Blackwell was taken out of the main event. It became Harley Race against David Von Erich, Harley winning with a co-feature of Kerry Von Erich beating Dick Murdoch on disqualification. Uh, it was supposed to be Kerry Von Erich and Ken Batero, I'm sorry, my error. Uh, 
Well, we'll go a little bit further on the Harley thing, but I do note that Harley was kind of reclaiming some victories over the Von Erichs here, which is fine. And uh, it was a strong card. Uh, Dick DeBruiser and Gene Kaniski, interesting tag team combination, beating Sergeant Slaughter and Roger Kirby. Kirby being a sub for Patera when Bruiser pins Slaughter. Uh, Dewey Robertson beating Kerry Brown, a sub for Blackwell, because of the snow, well, that couldn't be helped. But that was not the story of the evening. Do you want to tell it or should I? Well, it's Pat O'Connor, right? Yeah, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, came to our box office and attached the box office. That was a nice, interesting moment. Sam came to the show and never went in the dressing room. He said he just wanted to come and see it. He sat his night. Of course, he had his regular box, box 13 in the loge. And so he and his wife are there. And, of course, I have to go out and tell him, well, guess what? The Internal Revenue Service is in our box office because Pat O'Connor is a partner, and he has tax problems, and they've come in, and they're going to start collecting money. And we have a problem here. And that's where the relationship with our local CPA, Richard Kawanishi, really helped because Kawanishi eventually negotiated some sort of deal with the IRS where they would be able to collect the money that that Pat, unfortunately, owed the IRS over back taxes over a period of time. It was a crisis across the board. Uh, O'Connor, obviously, very shaken. Could have been a lot worse. And actually, he decided to move back to his native New Zealand. And it wasn't that night. It was, I want to say, it was around the week of the 25th of January, somewhere in that last week in January, he came in, and we spent some time together. And, you know, it was very nostalgic. And uh, I still remember him shaking my hand and saying, hey, you can take care of this. You can handle this. We've been together. You know how to do it. He says, you can count on Bob Brown. He says, you tell him what you want the guys to do, because I know you're going to be busy in the dressing room and so on and so forth. Just worked that stuff out with Brown. And, of course, Geigel is the president. So in the end, he was going to oversee any booking, and he would handle the payoffs to talent. And if he wanted to say no or something, he could. Harley Race, also a partner. But Harley was, I don't know if he was booking somewhere at the time. He was on the road an awful lot. Basically, he just popped up on certain shows, and we took care of that. But uh, that was you know, that, that was a hard night, for, certainly for Pat O'Connor, and I was sorry to see it. Larry, and, why did Pat decide to go? I mean, was there a real reason, or he just... Dis- nobody would ever tell me. And, of course, that's from the Kansas City people. Sam never knew either. A lot of people told me, one of the stories that came back, Bob Brown told me this later. He says, I think he's got money buried down there. He says, his mother's still alive. I think he's got money back there. And that's why he's getting out of the country before they dig in any deeper because they're going to get whatever they feel they're owed because I guess they were doing stuff possibly in Kansas City. That I do not know as a fact. Uh. But uh, whenever the IRS comes in and looks, that's not good. And the ironic thing about the IRS, and I may have mentioned this once before, I was with Sam earlier, I guess twice, when the IRS came in and audited the St. Louis Wrestling Club. And uh, we closed the office for a day, and I just wouldn't come in, and Sam wouldn't come in, and he just gave them the keys. And both times they were there, the St. Louis Wrestling Club did not owe a dime. So as far as Sam would, and Sam would brag about that all over here, he'd call people in wrestling, say, well, the IRS audited me. <laughs> no, we didn't know a thing. So, but that was Sam. But, of course, everything was run through a CPA, every bill. We didn't – I mean, we handled the money, but we didn't handle the money, if that makes sense. Well, most promotions handled the money, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Where we did it all through a CPA, a well-known CPA in the area, which I might as well add that now because that eventually became a problem a few months later when I came in one day and I had a letter from a CPA in Kansas City. And it had a farm in there, letter to introducing himself and saying, I talked to Bob and Harley, and if you would fill this stuff out and just send everything to me. What's this? Without telling me or Sam, who was still a consultant, by the way, he had agreed to stay as a consultant for a year, and he would be in and out of the office two, three times a week, simply because early on, I was all there was, and that didn't work because I was involved in a lot of different things, not only for myself, but also for the good of the St. Louis Wrestling Club at the time. So uh, all of a sudden we have this different accountant in Kansas City. And I, I think if I recall, I don't know if I quit that time, but I really hit the ceiling on that one. Here's a guy who just saved your butts, people. And now you're going to dump him for a guy from Kansas City. Well, yeah, but we're in Kansas City. We want to have control of that. Yeah, but the business is in St. Louis. So once again, I'm not saying they were wrong. Certainly not saying they were right either. You can see why, once again, 
something aside from wrestling, something aside from booking, was driving us in two different directions. And aside from this question that eventually we did hire some help, because uh, I had to get out of the office at times. I mean, you couldn't just leave the office empty. One for a while, we had hired a young lady who was the daughter of one of our longtime ticket sellers, but and she was fine, but she didn't want to make that her life's work, and she couldn't come in all the time, and she had other interests, so eventually she left. Ended up, we just hired people from Kelly Temper Services, and uh, you know, I'd have a temp in there, and she'd have to handle the phones or maybe some of the paperwork, especially the subscriptions to the wrestling news that you used to order back when you were a little youngster back in New York. Can you remember, Gary, when you were a No, youngster? I don't remember yesterday, Larry. Sorry. Okay. But again, so there was another ongoing problem. We really needed somebody else more stable in the office and more knowledgeable about it. Sam could come in a couple of days, but there were days I'd either have to be at Channel 11 doing things, I'd be involved with the Mobile Sclerosis Society doing things. I'd be involved with the St. Louis Sports Dinner doing things. We have promotion. I still did the promotion of the Harlem Globetrotters with Sam and did some things with the arena. So it wasn't just going to sit there in the office all day, which is what happened in most wrestling offices, and they couldn't understand. Well, why aren't you here? Well, because I'm having lunch, having a lunch in the day where the sports editor is going to be there and this guy from Channel 4 is going to be there. And even though they don't give us that much in wrestling, they don't do anything bad to us, and they like us. But they didn't understand, through no fault perhaps of their own because of the way they were raised in wrestling, that this is how it was in St. Louis. This is how you played the game in St. Louis, and this is why St. Louis had a very special relationship. And that was taking place over a period of four, five, six months at the start of 1982 as well. Larry, um, without naming any names, because doing these programs, I've heard so many stories about the uh, promoters uh, taking money directly from the box office and not paying taxes. I've heard that. Yeah. Is it, I don't know. I kind of, I guess it did have, it, was it complicated or difficult for that to happen or was it very easy for that to happen? Probably depended where you were. In St. Louis, I think it would have been very difficult to begin with because the state actually counted the money. They had all the tickets and they had to balance. They, they would actually work with our box office people and the two would have to balance. But we had to provide a ticket a ticket stub versus money, and at the end they had to balance out, and the, and the complimentary tickets would be separate. I mean, it, it was strictly a business thing, and there would be a box office statement produced at the end of the night. Many other territories, I recognize they didn't do it that way, so, and the athletic commissions weren't that tight, but it was not a problem if the athletic commission, I mean, we were friends with the athletic commission. We knew what the taxes were, and you pay them. It's so so down so, doing business. let's just say down south, we won't go any – and more specific than that, but down south, maybe in a, a lax state, uh, easy to do. Very 40, to do. 40, 50000 dollars gate for a big show, and they could do it, and they could do it in a Midwest state too. Trust me. Wow. Yeah, and they could do it on a ten thousand dollars show just as easily too. A ten thousand dollars show, you go into the boys and tell them, yeah, it was a ninety two hundred dollar house. Where would that other eight hundred dollars go? Well. You know, back then the top marginal tax rate was was really high. Uh, Ronald Reagan cut it back to twenty eight percent, but that was like in nineteen eighty six. So for right. these promoters to be getting paid in cash, that's that's big money, right? Yeah, I imagine so. I mean, once again, it was just something that the way we did it in St. Louis was different. I wasn't. I, I didn't know. I mean, we never touched the money. It's that simple, and everything had to balance number of tickets, tickets torn versus number of number of dollars in the box office and the state kept their part and then we got our part and so on we moved on from there you, you know it's amazing with these promoters making this kind of money and i'm getting a little bit ahead of us here but just to make a comment it's amazing that vince mcmahon didn't end up in the bottom of a river with cement shoes uh, you he know was not a popular figure in 1983 <laughs> 84 i can assure you of that <laughs> oh, okay we'll get back. Sure, there was a lot of there was a lot of money there was a lot of money yeah there's a lot of money at stake here I, I, definitely yeah was. Okay. Yeah, so we, that's what we're saying. When I, we talked at the very start of this, it's not going to necessarily be so much wrestling, but it's going to be all about wrestling. Well, yeah, money is about wrestling. This is a business, a very hard business. February 5th, 1982, Keele Auditorium, cancellation. First, for only the second time in St. Louis history. The first was during the 1950s when there was a labor dispute at Keele Auditorium, and the electricians union, I think, didn't come in, and they had to close the show and had to cancel the card that night. We had two snowstorms that, that week, uh, the worst in 70 years on January 31st. And then February 3rd, another one hit the town. And uh, it was a hard decision. I was torn, too, and Sam and I had talked, and we talked with Geigel. Uh, nobody really could get in. We 
it, it was a hard one to cancel. But uh, you can see how things are. Sam leaves, and, man, look at the first month, what we've gone through. Say, man, Sam, you sure you don't want to come back? Maybe it's God getting even with us. <laughs> you want to come back. But uh, nothing much you could do. It was so this was, this was this was only the because town of the was weather, right? Okay, okay. The town was shut down, period. Fe- February 19th, 1982, attendance 11,093. Yeah, we're working really hard after that one, of course. And, and of course, from a business standpoint, what are you still seeing? Everything's going well. Uh, Dick the Bruiser wins an 18-man battle royal. Uh, kind of an interesting final four, uh, which I rather like because I was able to kind of say, well, we finish with these four. Uh, I had Andre the Giant, Crusher Blackwell, Ken Patera, and the Bruiser at the end. Andre and Crusher Blackwell, because I kind of had a thought we could do something with them. They go out together, leaves Patera with the Bruiser. Patera tries to give the Bruiser a pile driver. Bruiser straightens up and backdrops Patera over the top rope. Dick the Bruiser wins the battle royal. Co-feature. Andre the Giant and Terry Funk ruled a draw against Harley Race and Crusher Blackwell when both teams were disqualified. Terry was a substitute for Dusty Rhodes, and uh, I don't really know. Again, now we're starting to get into the wrestling area where sometimes phone calls. I'm not sure how. I'm not sure what games were being played there, but I wasn't too sure. I, I wasn't a big fan of booking Dusty at that particular point in time. February 28, TV Ken Patera over Ray Hernandez. Yeah, I and mean, why did I mark that? That's a good question. I guess was that Ray, that was probably Ray Hernandez's first match here. No, I, he came there the week before. I marked it for a reason, probably just because they were two big muscle guys. But uh, eventually, we get, did give Ray Hernandez a nickname, Hercules Hernandez. That's one that uh, actually I think one of the referees, Lee Warren, or and his brother Eddie, they probably came up and they ought to call him Hercules. And, oh, I'll steal that nickname. We called him Hercules Hernandez, and of course that followed the late Ray Hernandez on to WWF. March 12, 1982, Kiel Auditorium, 6,888. And Dick the Bruiser wins two out of three falls from Ken Batera. Logic, after February the 19th show, where those are the last two in the Battle Royal, naturally you put them together. And it's also a rematch from the January 1st show with Sam. Third fall comes on a disqualification, Patera being disqualified. The Bruiser keeps the belt. And, geez, look at that co-feature. Harley Race beats Kerry Von Erich. Is there a trend developing here? Well, Harley, Harley Harley's uh, the big the big cheese now, right? Yeah, can't hard to tell him no. And, and in that case, it still wasn't that bad because, again, Harley, there was obviously more matches with him with the world champion. Yeah, and and we can get him more into that because that became more of an issue as we got to the fall of '82. I and think then, I I think the star that most people came to see though was in that is it the second match? Yeah, you, let's see, I gotta super look. super fly. <laughs> Ray Candy, I remember manager it. Sir Oliver Hunker, Humperdinck, working far, of course, came booked out of Kansas City. At the I, re- I remember Superfly from the world-class uh, tapings. It was uh, kind of a sloppy mask gimmick, huh? It was pretty ugly. <laughs> and, of course, he beat Eddie Gilbert, which is also kind of an historical name there, too. They had to, he beat Eddie Gilbert right before Eddie left the territory. You got, you got to know St. Louis is going to be changing with the Superfly in there, huh? I wasn't thrilled. But yeah. he was Kansas City, and, you know, we're going to have to use him to some farm. And I thought, well, we can beat him somewhere and get the, get the mask off him. But that turned out to be a little bit of an issue, too, as, as we'll see. Okay, before. we're going to get to that. Let's session. see. Here we go. Oh, we got more explosions coming. Okay, go ahead. Uh, March 26, 1982, Kilo Auditorium attendance, 10,272. A very logical thing to have. Ric Flair defending the title against Dick the Bruiser. The Bruiser's had a bunch of wins. Let's, let's put them together. They've had history together. Each man wins a fall. Flair pins the bruiser for the third fall, but it comes after referee Sonny Myers was knocked down and missed the bruiser covering Flair for what would have been a 10 count. Now, that's not my kind of finish. We'd worked out the finishes basically in the afternoon, and what we had agreed on in the dressing room, and I'm still doing ring announcing now, remember, too, in addition to handling the box office. Uh, we had agreed that this was the blow-off for Flair and bruiser for this particular point in time. And the finish we agreed on, which actually was what was done after the Sonny Myers thing, was that Flair and the Bruiser would collide in the middle of the ring. Bruiser stumbles down, and when Flair falls, he just falls on top of Bruiser with that half cover, and people have seen that finish before, one, two, three. Okay, well, as things evolved later in the dressing room, from the standpoint of Bob Brown and Bob Geigel, it was business as usual. Let's try to get out of it, a get-out-of-it finish, and not really have the bruiser pinned. Well, it didn't work so well because the crowd nearly rioted. If you're going to blow off a legend, you can't do it as a steal. 
that kind of finish yells rematch, 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 rematch. So you do that. That wasn't what Geigel and Brown were already arguing about. Different, different for the next. We're having an argument already about the next title match here in St. Louis in April. They want Rufus R. Jones for the match. And I want Gene Kaniski for the match. Uh, we can go into many arguments about that. Bottom line being, I thought it was a crap finish. Definitely a non-St. Louis finish. I felt that it just left a bad taste in everybody's mouths if you didn't give them a rematch. So I argued that if we, for the June show in the Checker Dome, where we're going back, that the Bruiser should get it. They all of a sudden then came up with the idea, well, maybe it should be Kerry Von Eric, who, of course, that very night, they had changed that finish in the dressing room, too, and had Roger Kirby beat Kerry Von Eric, who was counted out outside the ring. Now, Kerry in those days was beginning to have some problems outside the ring, and he could be a little flaky and forgetful sometimes, and people have heard those stories. So if it was based on I want to send a lesson to Kerry, I could understand that. If it's based on I'd like to surprise the crowd once in a while, you know, I could even understand that. But if it was just done to get the Kansas City guy over, when the Kansas City guy, while he's a good performer, solid performer, was a preliminary performer, why in the hell are you doing it? Plus they changed it. So after that show, we had another argument, and I quit again. Uh, this is now, a bunch of- now, wait a minute, Larry. You're the general manager and the booker, but you don't seem to be managing too much here. Well, and that was what led to the whole argument. And this this was this was the biggest blow up at, the, at that particular time. And I, I made the argument to him. I said, you can't give me the responsibility to the public and then not give me the authority to do it. That's baloney. Well, we made a mistake. It ended up that uh, Geigel, Geigel came down, Vern Gagne flew in, and we had this big meeting about St. Louis. Me, Gagne, Geigel, and eventually we had Sam come in. And they said they understood. Geigel said he understood. We're going to do, th- I understand, we're going to try to work with you better. We're not going to let those things happen. It was a mistake. They agreed with putting Kaniski into the match in April. They agreed with going to the Bruiser at the Checker Dome. Kind of put a little pressure on me, but I was willing to take my chance on that. Uh, Rufus R. Jones and Ric Flair, what was that going to draw at that point in time? Nothing against Rufus, but he hadn't drawn a main event crowd in 12 years. Yeah. Then he only drew one. So why would that happen? Kaniski had always been a consistent draw. We'd used him on the TV after that. We were going to bring in his son. St. Louis was a sucker, and I mean this in a very positive, affectionate way, a sucker for the father-son angle. It was so easy for me as a TV announcer and the person writing the publicity to sell Gene Kaniski's last hurrah, his son's there. He's going to win that title for his son. He doesn't know how long he'll last if he wins it, but by golly, he's going to go all out and he's going to try to win it in front of his son who's making his debut. It was so easy to sell. And, of course, I didn't waste any time. We came out with the next program. In the wrestling news I had in there, Gene Kaniski has determined that Dick the Bruiser should be the world champion. He is the uncrowned champion. And if I beat Ric Flair, the first man I'll defend the title against is Dick the Bruiser. Yeah, Gene Kaniski was an old guy at this point. But once again in St. Louis, the legends matter. Dick the Bruiser mattered. Even though he was a shadow of himself in many ways, Gene Kaniski mattered. And if you see one of the tapes of Gene in those days, even though he's probably 50 years old, he could go faster than half the guys who were 20 years younger than him. Dave Meltzer even told me once, too, he saw a tape of Kaniski from one of our St. Louis shows in there, and Dave said to me, he says, he's amazing. He said he could have worked today. He just moved so quick and so fast. He blew everybody up in the ring, and he was in a six-man tag match. He was the only guy who could still go. I knew we'd get a match out of Flair and Kaniski. Kaniski would put the man over. It told a story. There was a story from him having been the referee, not that there was any great problem between them, but we'd had so much publicity out of it. You knew there would be enough people who would want to come back to see Kaniski in that match. So anyhow, for all those arguments, from the booking standpoint, things kind of worked out. I guess, though, behind the scenes, again, no right or wrong in many ways. They knew wrestling their way. I knew wrestling my way from St. Louis. Why would you buy... St. Louis, when it's done so well for so long, to change everything. I could not understand that. I could not accept that. Who who was the main culprit? Was it Harley? Was it Bob Geigel? I know Vern. Bob Geigel was the front man. I think Harley maybe had his moments. I don't think Harley was 
it's easy to make somebody the villain, and I don't want to make anybody the villain. I mean, it's just the way they felt it should be. I mean, I had them tell me at different times. Geigel told me, and Harley told me, we know you want to open it up. We know you want to open up. You had to be going crazy here with Sam holding you back like this. Open up what? Yeah, open up what? We drew 19,819 people. And the show before that at the Checker Dome, we do 18,000. And the one before that, we drew 16,000. Why yeah. would I want to change anything? Let's keep doing this until it doesn't work. Well, what they, we what they mean, because they were running the worst promotion in the world in Kansas City. Was that they open? Would tell, no, they would tell me, we open it up up in Kansas City. We know you <laughs> want to do it a lot of ways like we do it. No, oh, my God. Oh. No, I don't. No, I don't. If we had a failure to communicate. It was like a marriage where things just didn't work. It was two different philosophies. And whether it was paying the bills or our public image in terms of me being the face of the promotion locally with business people and and especially with the media, we just had different ideas. They didn't understand how important it was in St. Louis to be at a ball game, to be at a hockey game, to stop by the press box, to pay your respects to Bob Burns and Bob Briggs. Hey, Mr. Briggs, how you doing? How's everything? Thank you so much. Anything we can do? Do you need any tickets for the show Friday? They really, I don't think, understood that. Not because they were wrong or anything else, just because they never had to do it. But that's how St. Louis worked. Why do you want to fix it if it's not broken? And, of course, my argument, again, Kellis came back to, you want me to have the responsibility without the authority, and, guys, that's not going to work. So were you still in the office alone? Uh, We probably had uh, Julie, the gal, the ticket seller's daughter, in there three or four days a week at that point, so that helped a little bit. Are you starting to think that your uh, career options here are are limiting, or are you I'm already thinking, and Charlie Mancuso and I are talking, and even this early, I I believe I was talking to Vince McMahon Jr. and telling him some of my problems. We were talking fairly often on the phone back in this period. Okay, wait a minute. We're in 1982. We're in the first quarter-ish, and you're talking to Vince? Well, I've been talking to him off and on since the mid-'70s, and I think we talked about how we first met him, and because of Vince McMahon Sr., wanted to copy some of the promotion things we did with both the wrestling news being mailed out to subscribers before a show and also because of season tickets, how we handle our season tickets. And he wanted to use those those two things for, I want to say, Baltimore and Washington. He had two markets where he wanted to do it. I talked to Vince, a couple, Vince Jr. about it a couple of times. Vince Jr. put me in contact with Howard Finkel. And Howard had just started working for the World Wrestling Federation in 1980. And that's where Howard and I became good friends, and we'd trade stories. And then, you know, I usually end up talking to Vince Jr. at some point, and we'd tell some stories and laugh some stories. And, I mean, obviously there were some words getting around the wrestling business about, geez, I don't know what's going on in St. Louis. So so in 1982, you're talking to Vince. Oh, yeah. Is he giving you any hints that he's got plans, anything? Nope. Nothing? Nope. Everybody in the wrestling business, in my mind, if anybody's looking anywhere, we're all looking at Atlanta. We're all looking at WTBS. We're all looking at Jim Barnett. They've made moves into, uh, I think, Pennsylvania. They'd run a couple of shows. They'd run shows in Ohio. That's where everybody thought the threat was, with a secondary threat being Vern Gagne, because Vern was a little rambunctious, too, and he tried San Francisco and different areas, too. So those are probably the two people that everybody was looking at. I don't even think Fritz von Erich was being looked at quite as a threat because he was part of the NWA, where the other, Barnett had always been ambitious, and he'd always been willing to spread out. So I don't think any, there may be, maybe there were a couple people looking or thinking, but very bluntly, I just didn't see it, and I didn't hear it, that Vince was the one they were looking at. I think they were looking elsewhere. And WTBS was the logical thing because they had the tool to do it. They were already on TV everywhere. Do you, do you think, looking back at it, the while you're talking to Vince, Vince has got these ideas rolling around. He must have, right? Sure. It's something in his head. Whether or not it's formulated, and I don't want to, it's not making him change any decisions he's making. But I'm sure it's making him think, well, he's looking for opportunities probably. Things were formulating in his head. Who knows? I mean, at this point, I knew myself that the time was limited that I was going to be at the Salem's Wrestling Club, that oh. this was not going to last. Okay. I could either get out of wrestling. Or I could go on my own, and it'd be like 1945 all over again in St. Louis. Scary. Oh, man. Okay, we're going to get to that. April. This is great. April 16th, 1982, Kiel Auditorium. Another good house. 8,024. Dick the Bruiser beats Crusher Blackwell by disqualification. And Dewey Robertson gets his main event against Ken Patera. 
which not bad, eight thousand people to see that show, and they, you know, Dewey did okay. Uh, Gene Kaniski in the semifinal with Rufus R. Jones. I couldn't pass up doing that match against Sergeant Slaughter and Superfly. When Kaniski pins Superfly, he doesn't have to unmask because it's a tag match. But uh, once again, I couldn't, I couldn't pass that up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> yeah, I know. I felt guilty. I mean, that was even terrible in world class, you know? It was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's why I let, let, Gene, let Gene run poor Superfly all over that ring. Okay. See if he can keep up with the old man. <laughs> Let's move ahead. April 30th, 1982, Kiel Auditorium. And here's where Gene Kaniski gets his title match with Ric Flair. Uh, attendance, 9,775. I guarantee you that's more than we'd have drawn with Rufus R. Jones against Ric Flair for the title. Kaniski wins the first fall. Flair wins the second with the figure four leg lock. Kaniski cannot answer the bell for the third fall because of a knee injury from the figure four. Uh, semifinal, Dick the Bruiser beats Harley Race on a count out outside the ring. Kelly Kaniski's underneath the card beating Jerry Brown. And in the preliminary, in the second match, for one showing only, Michael Hayes of the Freebirds is there. And with his music, beating Ron McFarlane out of Kansas City. Full, full Freebird uh, entrance? Oh, yeah. Yeah, take a look at it. I mean, he was on he was on Dallas. I was not against it. And by this point, this was a show where I really stopped doing the ring announcing, except for special occasions at the Checker Dome. Uh, there was too much work and too many politics happening. I wasn't comfortable not being involved in things that might happen behind my back, did, even though I did not have the final say on them. Did Michael get there, over? We had to agree on him. Did Michael? Mike... He, they reacted well to him. Uh, and we didn't bring him back. I really don't have any reason why or why not. As much as anything, though, they probably had him booked pretty heavily in Texas. And if nothing else, you're showing a sh- you're showing a star on a card, helping to build up a card underneath it. And uh, what did you think of him in the in the ring as a single? He's okay. He's fine. I mean, he's colorful. I mean, it was a it was a blowout. I think they went like five or six minutes. Okay, so, okay. not expecting miracles. Uh, he was fine. It was a colorful moment, and, and it added something to the show. And for what it's worth, Kaniski had a great match with Flair in the main event. He put Flair over like a million dollars. It was a championship performance across the board. Okay, May 9th, 1982 TV taping. Ken Patera defeats David Von Erich. Yeah, I just like that match. Again, it's just one I put in to make TV better. Remember, we talked about May being sweeps periods for ratings in those times, and I figured we'd always figure out a way to get this back. It was a good combination. It felt good chemistry-wise, Patera and David Von Erich. What we did was I gave it a 20-minute time limit, and they went to, like, 1912 or something like that. They get in a fight on the apron after Ken knocked him out, knocked David Von Erich out of the ring. David gets on the apron. He gets Patera in the iron claw, but the referee has been counting. David's standing on the apron. Patera's inside the ring caught in the claw, so David's actually counted out even though he has Patera in the claw. It was a just a very good, strong match for TV and uh, left us something in the bank for down the road. May 14, 1982, Kiel Auditorium. 10,119. Still getting some people there, aren't we? Interesting tag match in the main event. Andre the Giant and Dick the Bruiser, the dream team, against Dick Murdoch and Crusher Blackwell. Murdoch beats Bruiser for one fall. Andre wins over disqualification by Blackwell, thus keeping that little feud alive for something I was hoping to do and did do at the Checker Dome in October. And then the third fall of the Bruiser pins Murdoch. Uh, semifinal, Dewey Robertson beat Ray Hernandez, who was a sub for Jack Briscoe. And again, one of those little problems. I'd been hoping to slide Briscoe into position. We originally thought Terry Funk, but Terry wasn't in a position because of Japan or something to fill it. Looking for a title, somebody to do a title match in September, I felt, or in August rather, I felt that was owed to Jack Briscoe. And we've talked about how Jack quite often had been very generous with doing favors as a former world champion in St. Louis. What was happening at that time, simply because, again, of the office time and Brown helping me, Bob Brown, that we would often divide up calls to different offices. Brown was supposed to call Florida about Jack Briscoe on that. I was making a call to whatever office for somebody else. We'd, we would divide it up. Probably I was dealing with Minneapolis for the most part there. Anyhow, bottom line was Briscoe no-showed it. I never had a chance to ask Jack, but that's not Jack Briscoe. I would question in my mind, I questioned even then, if Jack even knew that he was booked here, because I think some other games were being played. And, of course, it put Dewey Robertson, a Kansas City guy, in a spot where he was going to get another win. Unfortunately, some websites I've seen and some, some uh, results people, as, as we've seen over the years, they get it wrong and they still list it as Dewey Robertson beat Jack Briscoe. That match never even happened, folks. Jack Briscoe wasn't even in St. Louis. He beat Ray Hernandez. 
Would and, and would the office out, would the office have bought a plane ticket for Jack typically for something like that? In those days, they bought their own plane tickets. Oh, okay. So there was no way to say, "Oh, he's got a ticket," so he did no show. Yeah. So yeah. So no, he. I questioned whether Jack even knew it. Okay. And of course, after that, uh, we again we were having another meeting, and there's this question: Well, nobody knows about Briscoe, and a lot of fog, a lot of smoke. And I said, "Well, hey, we need somebody for that August card. How about we put Dory Jr. in there?" And everybody, oh yeah, they like that idea of putting Dory Funk Jr. in there. So. I'll go with it. That, that's fine. You know, it's too bad, but I could see there was going to be a problem. There were enough problems. I didn't need another one arguing for Jack, and I didn't want to have any more double crosses. If we were all comfortable with Dory Funk Jr., that was fine with me. Let's go with Dory Jr. And he hadn't had a match with Flair either, so the only could get something out of that. That was fine. May 23rd TV taping, Dick the Bruiser and Bulldog Bob Brown over Ric Flair and Jerry Brown. Well, what we were doing there uh, started with Flair and I talked quite a bit. We wanted to give as much help as we could to the Checker Dome show for June 12th, which was going to be Flair versus the Bruiser. So we started a little two- or three-week program on TV there just to remind everybody, still saying how Dick the Bruiser is the uncrowned world champion, and talking about the finish, just very bluntly talking about it. So we put that tag match on TV where the Bruiser and Brown went from Flair and Jerry Brown when Flair was counted out outside the ring. Uh, What had happened was Flair tried to wrap Bruiser's foot around the ring post, which a lot of people saw Ric Flair do in those days, but instead Bruiser kicked, sent Flair flying into our press table, down he went, Bruiser goes outside the ring, gives Flair a pile driver on the floor, leaves him for dead on the floor, rolls into the ring, and Flair's counted out outside the ring on that show May 23rd, which leads to June 6th. Do you want to talk about it, or should I? No, you should. Okay. June 6th, we did the uh, Ritz Ric Flair against our Cruz. During the match, Dick the Bruiser is going to come out to the ringside, he took the belt, and he took Ric Flair's robe. And, again, we have this on a, one of the classic Samus videos, too. And Dick paraded around the ring, had the belt on. It was a fun finish to put in. Uh, I can remember when we did it, uh, Ric Flair telling Art Cruz, he says, Brother, this is a shoot. He says, because I'm going to go nuts when I see the bruiser out there. And the only way I don't get the bruiser, and, and we'd agreed, he should never touch Dick the bruiser at that point while the bruiser is having a spasm. So... Flair is going crazy trying to get to him, and Art Cruz, is, who is a good amateur wrestler, he's trying to take Rick down. He's hanging on to him for dear life, and because they treated it as a shoot, it really worked. In the end, Flair and Cruz tumbled outside the ring. The bruiser threw the robe up in the air, twirled it over his head, threw it on the mat, stomped on it, and threw the robe into the crowd. Uh, and That certainly was the final farewell for, uh, for that angle, setting up the, the Checker Dome show. Flair did a great interview, having crying, whining. There's only Ric Flair could do in those days about what they've done to his manhood. And then Dick the Bruiser comes on and does an interview and says, do you really want a sissy who wears a girdle into the ring as your world champion? I mean, it was a great interview. By yeah, the- I remember this. I remember yeah. this. Terrific, terrific interview. And actually, the Bruiser, we had him in a squash right after that against Ray Hernandez, Hercules Hernandez. And I have to give Hernandez credit, too. It was only about a two- or three-minute match. I still remember because at one point... The bruiser, of course, took him outside the ring. He's going to put him in our press table. And when he launches him, Hernandez goes sailing over the top of the table and hits the artificial wall that was a screen behind us. They could do chromo key shots with television in those days. He hits that wall and knocks the wall over behind the TV behind the TV platform. Uh, it was a great finish. And uh, needless to say, when we go to the Checker Dome on June 12, 1982, Gary, you got the honors. What was the house? Well, 19,027, so you guys are still doing something right. Can Dick the Bruiser draw? Was that the right decision? Wow. I mean, was he the wrestler he used to be? No, no, of course not. Yet that night, and I think he knew it was his farewell, too. And he knew I fought for him to get that match. He knew there were people against him because he's talking to Sam this whole time. Him and Sam are still tight as thieves. They're talking all the time. Dick did a lot of things that I didn't know he could do. He actually ran the ropes a few times. They even did the uh, spot where Flair would drop down, the bruiser runs over the top, the bruiser comes back off the other rope, and Flair leapfrogs him. I didn't know Dick could run across the ring anymore because he had to be 52, 53 at that time. It was a great match, and the finish was a very simple one, two, three. Bruiser goes for a pile driver, which, if you'll recall, he had done to Flair on television on the floor and knocked Flair out. He goes for the pile driver inside the ring, but Flair goes up with a beautiful back body drop and a bridge behind it. One, two, three. The crowd accepted it. 
and if anything, it certainly made Ric Flair stronger. And the undercard was a strong card. Well, and, and let me interrupt you. If, if Maybe if Flair had been booked like that more throughout the 80s, yes, it, it might have made a big difference in how things eventually worked out. Did Thank Fla- you for saying that. I agree. Yeah, because I look back at the 80s with Rick, and I always, you know, I always said, take a few shots at it here and there, but mainly, you know, losing, 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 even though he's NWA champion, which is uh, kind of contradicts the thing of being a champion. That is exactly right, and I still believe that a heel with a clean win, when he's a good heel, when he's a great performer, he will get the most heat ever. And I'm sorry, we're proving it right there with Ric Flair, just as it was proven with Harley Race and just as it was proven with Gene Kaniski when he was the champion years behind it. You can have those moments where you get beat up. You can have those moments where you're in jeopardy. But in the end, the heel needs to win. The champion needs to win. And it's not going to hurt the loser at all. I mean, Dick the Bruiser was still a legend here. It certainly didn't hurt him. How many times? We go through the 60s. How many times are we going to cross match that Dick the Bruiser lost? And he's still selling out Keel Auditorium or he's drawing. Here, this was 19 years after his St. Louis debut. And he still drew 19,000 people at the Checker Dome. I mean, that's within 800 people of a sellout. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, definitely. It is. It is. Uh, Dusty Rhodes, Ted DiBiase, had a DQ over Race and Murdoch. Got Dory Jr. a win. Guess who wanted to bring King Kong Brody back on that show? Because other problems were developing. I talked him into bringing back Brody. Yeah, because he's been missing in action in St. Louis, right? Yeah, he's been missing in there. And, of course, he's been busy in other towns and everything. But uh, I liked him. We were friends. And I felt, even then, that he had a checkered old main event in with him. I thought him and Flair would be a good combination. I was already starting to mention it. And, of course, Geigel would go, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't think that. I'd say it to Brown, and Brown would say, oh, they won't like that. I said, oh, good, let's do it. You know, they won't like it, but they'll be real happy when we draw fifteen, sixteen thousand, 16000 and, you know, have a $125,000 house. Uh, so we've got Brody in there for a squash. David and Kerry Von Eric over Patera and Blackwell. David pinning Patera. Oh, remember what happened on TV with the countout? David got even here. David pins Patera after Blackwell accidentally hits Ken Patera. And then we had a little bump between myself and Bob Geigel. What a surprise. Uh, involving your favorite mass wrestler, Superfly. Rufus R. Jones pins him. Two Kansas City guys. Fine, do what you want underneath. I can live with it. He pins him. Well, I was doing the ring announcing because it was the Checker Dome. I mean, I know we're going to beat him. And I just assume that they know this is St. Louis. Never assume anything, Larry. Please, pay attention, Larry. I assume they know that this means we're going to unmask the fellow. Well, Ray Candy starts to get out of the ring. Larry's got the microphone, and I said, well, he's not going to do that. I said, ladies and gentlemen, he's refusing to unmask, but the superfly, the mass superfly is Ray Candy from wherever he was in Texas. Oh, he was hot. I get back to the dressing room afterwards. Guy comes up and says, why did you do that? He says, because we always do that in St. Louis. He says, well, we're not going to do it in Kansas City, and I don't think we should do it in St. Louis now. I says, well, news to me. Maybe we ought to talk about this, you think. But as of right now, he loses. He's unmasked. He doesn't want to unmask. I'm going to say who it is. Poor Bob, he just threw up his hands walked away. You know. Now, when you said that it was Ray Candy, did you think before you said it, oops, this might cause a problem? I really didn't give a damn. So, okay, but what I'm getting at is <laughs> No, it was St. Louis. He lost. We tell who he is. Yeah, but did you, did you say it like a little bit of saying it was to piss off Geigel? Oh, I'm sure that was probably in my mind, uh, you know, just to stir up the people okay, there. Okay, okay. And it almost sounds like I'm making Bob a heel because there were a lot of times, yeah, we've had our bumps in there, but there are a lot of times we're getting along good. And a couple times he'd sit and say to me, I don't understand why we can't get along. I don't understand what the problem is. And you know what? He didn't. And I maybe didn't either. So maybe there's some fault both ways. Maybe yeah. I couldn't accept the way he was, the way he'd come up in the business. But now, uh, now, I, I was willing to fight for St. Louis. So. Now, we're going to stop here. But Sam is still a consultant, right? Right. Do you want to go through the July show real quick? Well, we got out of town here. Okay, well, we'll do out of town. Let's do, let's do the July show very quickly to okay, set up. Okay, hold on, here, hold on. Hold then on. we got a real long period. Let's see. Uh, July 4th. Yeah, do the TV. Okay, we're off the air right now, are we? No, we're on the air. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Nice that everybody's listening. Let's, let's do the <laughs> July 4th TV. Okay, go ahead. Okay, we got the NWA champion Ric Flair and Crusher Blackwell against Ken Patera and Dory Funk Jr. Ken kind of becoming a halfway babyface now, which I argued against, but Ganya was insisted that he'd be a babyface here because he was going to be a babyface in Minneapolis, which naturally didn't make much sense to me because the Minneapolis tape didn't play here. I didn't care. Nonetheless, Flair and Funk 
were both counted out outside the ring. They had a little uh, moment where they had a confrontation, and that would set the stage up for a match in August. Prior to that, however, we had our July show, July 16th, 1982, at Keel, 6,668, double main event, Crusher Blackwell pins Ken Patera, and Dory Funk Jr. beats our old friend Gene Kaniski, who still does what's right for business as Dory Jr. wins with the spinning toehold, thus setting himself up as the next challenger as we go in 1982 for Ric Flair. Okay, so is that that's it? Is that enough for is that enough for one half of a year? Geez, I had a headache just thinking about it. Larry, right? that was great. Yeah, well, it gets even more explosive in the second half. And I apologize to people. I hope it didn't bore some of them. But bore them. This should have been done 20 years ago, Larry. I I always wondered that was I was very hazy about how St. Louis winded down. Because you guys here, you're, you're still drawing these great shows. Oh, 19,000 people to checker them. And, you know, you just think of the possibilities of what could have happened. Let's yeah. not name any villains yet. Everyone probably has a little bit of responsibility. We all do. I are, do, too. Are you still talking to Sam? Well, you must be still. How often are you Sam's talking still, to Oh, Sam's in and out of the office two, three times a week. And, I mean, we're talking regularly. Would and you he, Would you complain to Sam? Like, oh, man, this is, you know. I'm a, sometimes he complained to me. Did he this, did he regret isn't... did he regret selling it or never? He never told me he did. I don't think he did because I don't forget the man's you know at this point seventy eight years old and he knew. Uh, and again, there were different things where we were talking, which became more prominent as the year went along. Where he's saying, "You're giving them too much. You're giving them too much. They're not paying you enough. They need to offer you stock." And then, so. From that standpoint, hearing that, uh, I, mean, I can see where the Geigel faction would not be happy with Sam to hear that. On the other hand, virtually everything we've talked about in some farm, I have in the, the first book I wrote, the Wrestling at the Chase book about the war. So we're not, yes, we're, t- we're talking about secrets in a different way, and I think it, it has a certain more emotional impact, perhaps, more compelling when you talk about it verbally and live, as Gary, you and I are doing here now, maybe from reading it. But uh, this isn't anything that hasn't been said before by me, and you know they can have they have their opinions. I'm sure of how it went too, and sometimes I probably wasn't their favorite guy either. But wow, the way it was. Okay, Larry, we're, tomorrow night maybe. Sounds like a winner to me. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gary. We'll be in touch soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.